<laughs> Hello, everyone. Nice to see ya. <laughs> Hello, heathens. <laughs> Welcome to the show. <laughs> Throw up a, hey, what's up in chat? Let me know you're here. Um, if there's any problems with the audio or the video, we do have our dear sweet psychopomp, uh, Mercury, is still in retrograde. So every now and then, the robots, acting a little weird, <laughs> acting a little strange. You never know. But come on in. Make yourselves at home. We will get started here very, very shortly. Uh, we have, you know, a lot to talk about tonight, <laughs> as usual. <laughs> so come on in, make yourselves at home. Wherever you are, kick your shoes off, take off your pants, you know, do what you got to do to make it right. <laughs> uh, if this is your first time at one of my classes, uh, I do, in fact, recommend making it nice for yourself. You might grab something to drink. You might grab a snack. Um, I recommend a journal for taking notes. Uh, you might grab some art supplies if you feel like taking notes in ways that don't involve words. Um, yay. Hi, Patty. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> Woohoo. Thanks for coming. Um, if you have access to your natal chart, if you're a person that practices astrology, uh, you might grab your natal chart for reference. We're going to talk about astrology tonight. Um, if you work with tarot, you might grab your tarot deck because we're going to talk about tarot tonight. Um, you know, we're going to get it in there. You might grab a calendar as well because we're going to talk about holy days um, that are pagan and otherwise covering the next six to eight weeks. So we're going to get into it tonight my heathens. <laughs> we have a lot to discuss. <laughs> um, also, if this is your first time here, um, a little spiel about me. Uh, I am a 21st century witch, heathen, pagan, magician, um, shaman. And uh, I um, work with data and magical experience. <laughs> I've been doing this work publicly for 10-ish years. I have been studying magic and paganism and, and pursuing my own spiritual path for, well, most of my life, maybe my entire life, definitely over 40 years of work on this stuff. <laughs> Lark, yay! Hello, nice to see you. Thanks for showing up. <laughs> um, so uh, I have lots of different ways that you can work with me in the world. I do these Wheel of the Year classes every six to eight weeks for the Wiccan Sabbaths. Um, but I also have a weekly podcast called Spinning the Wheel for weekly guidance to work with all this work. Uh, it's a lot of information. Um I have an irregular newsletter that's totally free. You can sign up for that. It's an easiest way to um, stay in touch with me. Of course, uh, it's always incredibly occult and heathenistic to like the video, sub to the channel, you know, all of that stuff that we're supposed to say here on the internet when we're making content. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but I teach tarot workshops. Um, and I've got a really cool workshop going right now. It's already sold out. It's already started uh, called Welcome to Tarot. Uh, but in March, I will be offering three standalone tarot workshops. One is just a nice, magical, trippy excursion through the major arcana. One is going to be all about reversals and different ways of working with inverted tarot cards. And uh, the third one is going to be about the cross-section between tarot and astrology. Uh, and one of the things that we're going to do in that class is learn how to read our natal chart like a tarot reading so looking forward to all of that um i also have a patreon i have a lot of exclusive or you get it first stuff that happens through patreon uh one of those things is tarot circle uh that's going to be happening next month in the middle of the month 15th 16th 17th somewhere near lupercalia uh and um uh that's just a a hour and a half, two hour 
jaunt through some kind of a tarot subject or another. Um, not sure what we're talking about in February just yet, but uh, that's coming up as well. Um, is that everything? Yeah, I think that's everything. Oh, I also see clients. <laughs> I do astrology readings and I do tarot readings for people. And I also do magical consultations. If you've received a piece of jewelry that has a symbol on it and you don't know what it means, or you're thinking about getting a tattoo done and um, you're not sure of exactly what would be right to put in the tattoo or what this symbol means, again, come talk to me. Um, we can do some magical research together and learn uh, all about that thing that you're about to mark your body with until the end of time. <laughs> Hi, Lauren Jackson. Woo. Hello. <laughs> That's a heck of a namesake. I'm sure you get that all the time, but wow. Hell of a three point shot you got there, girl. <laughs> yes. I just made a sports reference. Oh my God. <laughs> my hidden dike is showing. I apologize. everyone. I'll just tuck that right back. There we go. <laughs> right next to the cat litter. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we have probably screwed around more or less enough. So let me <sighs> officially welcome you. Hello, heathens. Welcome to uh, the Wheel of the Year in bulk, a six-week guide to Candlemas and the quickening of winter. Um. I bet there are a lot of you. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> um, in this season, we are, you know, no big deal, just waking up from death. That's it. <laughs> Pretty casual. Um, in in bulk season, we are to to get us oriented in the wheel. We are just coming out of Yule season which kicks off with winter solstice. And this, for uh, all of us folks here in the Northern Hemisphere, is the low point of the, um, the sun's energy, the solar energy that's happening. And the sun is the physical manifestation or the physical representation of lots of deities all over the world throughout time. Um, so this phenomenon of the sun seeming to go away or end or die or at the very least take a nap was pretty shocking for people. Um, how do we know? Well, because nearly every major religion marks it. <laughs> um, nearly every major religion posits the birth or the rebirth or the re-enlightenment of their deity on or extremely close to winter solstice. It was kind of a big deal for a lot of people. Um, and so the, the following six-ish weeks after winter solstice, it's pretty dang dark most places in the winter solstice, or most places in the Northern Hemisphere, except for folks that are really close to the hemisphere where the day and night difference is not too extreme, but there is even still some there. Um, but the further north you go on the globe, the more extreme that difference is. And those weeks, those days and weeks following winter solstice are extremely dark and very cold. Um, we talked about the science of that in the winter solstice class. Go back and watch my winter solstice class if you want to understand more of um, what's happening with the planetary tilt and our proximity to the sun and our orbit and all of that stuff. It does affect um, or create the effect of the winter solstice. Um, but here... We have rolled out and away from that uh, a little bit in our orbit around the sun. And uh, our days are slowly, incrementally getting a little bit longer. And the sun is creeping a little bit higher in the sky every day, in fact. Um, a phenomenon that I talk about in just about every class is the movement of the sun. Because again, it was kind of a big deal to the ancients. And our sun has gone as far south on the eastern and western horizons as it possibly can at winter solstice. And it is slowly climbing back north on the eastern and western horizons at sunrise and sunset every day those are happening just a little bit further north and a little bit more and a little bit more until we eventually get to winter solstice so or excuse me uh, summer solstice so this is our first 
big marker after that darkness, after that death, really, and rebirth. But we're not quite ready for action just yet. <laughs> um, and so what we experience in in bulk season is a type of tension and a type of suspension between death, winter solstice, and the next big solar marker, which is spring equinox. And we're kind of suspended or hung between the two. And we're not dead anymore. We're not in the super dark part of winter, but we're still in winter. We can look outside and for a lot of us, there's still plenty of frost and ice and snow on the ground or on the buildings around us. And even if we don't have frost or snow, we may have lots of storms and lots of rain happening. And even if we don't have that, we probably don't have the level of abundance and growth in our natural world that we're gonna see at the high point in June, July, August, September. It's the opposite of that. It's the death of all of that. It's the stillness of all of that. That's a lot of what we're doing in Yule season. And in in bulk season, we are beginning to stir in the stillness. We are beginning to wake up and transition out of our form of hibernation, stillness, death, napping, holy sacred napping, um, and into whatever it is that we are going to be reborn as when spring shows up eight or so weeks from now. That's the main gig of what it is that we're working with in in bulk season. This transitionary period of leaving death, leaving sleep, but still drifting a bit because we're not in the actual action phase of spring just yet. And so a lot of uh, the major themes and the major work that we are working with at in bulk season is or are purification, perseverance, renewal, and dreams. Um, these are pivotal, really, during this season um, in terms of purification. And we're going to see these four themes and some other themes. These aren't the only ones, but these are the big ones for pagans and witches and heathens and, you know, <laughs> our kind. <laughs> Weirdos like us that set stuff on fire, draw stars on everything. Uh, <laughs> the purification, perseverance, renewal, and dreams. This is the stuff that we're going to get kind of repeated over and over to us over the next, you know, eight weeks or so. Um, and, and so what is that? That's, we're, you're, we're purifying ourselves from, by letting go of the old year, we're going to talk about that symbolism, and getting ready for the new year. We are digging in on perseverance because we still have several weeks to go before that spring energy is going to be here. And by this point in winter, it's tough sometimes, right? Our serotonin production is really low. Our melatonin production is really high. I lovingly re refer to serotonin as our give a shit chemical that our brain makes. And we're not making a lot of give a shit at this time of year. I just don't give a shit at this time of year so much. Actually, I love winter, but I understand seasonal defective, affective disorder. Um, and, and, you know, even for those of us that love winter, February time is sort of this drifting, timeless, gray, foggy time out of time, almost this, um, you know, space beyond space sort of a thing. Um, and that's actually really cool. That's actually really, really helpful for us. We folks in the West, um, never slow down. We are exhausting and exhausted. Uh, we are built and educated and directed into lives that just say grind forever, work as hard as you possibly can, you know, go, 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 achieve, achieve, achieve. It's never going to be enough. Um, and at winter, in some way or another, nature itself, our physiology itself is like, sit down. 
<laughs> you need to slow down. You're going to sleep more. You're going to eat a little bit more. You're going to care a little bit less and, and disassociate from the world a little bit. And, uh, and, and, and we're going to recoup some of our energy during this moment. We're going to come to a point of stillness and we're going to recoup some of our energy a little bit before we head back out to spring and go, 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 achieve, achieve, do, do, do. And in bulk season gives us an opportunity after death, but before waking to dream and to envision and to wonder at what it is that we are going to do and be and bring about when that actual awakening of the energy in spring really kicks in and whoop, we're on the roller coaster at that point. There's no coming back. And so I will often say to folks, we cannot rush these last weeks of winter. And I totally understand when you want to. I totally understand when it's like, I'm over it. I want to go to the naked park. <laughs> I want to go to the naked beach. Like I'm, I'm done with this. I want it to be warm. I want to wear my, um, you know, irresponsible clothes. I want to be free <laughs> in the sun, rolling in the grass somewhere, eating a salad, you know, or whatever, right? Laughing, right? <laughs> if you know, you know. Um, and, 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 I, and I get that. I completely understand that, especially in the times that we live in. I'm going to get to slides and content here in a minute. But especially in the times that we live in, because we have a really tremendous once in a century event happening on our planet. Oh, wait, we actually have several of them happening all at the same time on our planet. Any one of these events that our species is dealing with would be heavy duty stuff. And we're dealing with multiple of them at the same time. And many of those situations have created a space where we all feel like we are hovering. We can't plan for tomorrow. We can't really hold on to anything that's happening right now because it could close or change or end or, or, you know, be deleted or whatever at any time. And, and there is this real like, oh, kind of thing that's going on, this um, enforced, like infinite present tense awareness um, that really can feel ungrounded and destabilized and frozen at the same time. I can't go anywhere, but I don't know where I am either. And in bulk season is a lot of that. And so, oh no, but cool. Wait, I'm actually surrounded by biorhythms and natural systems that are going through the same thing as me. What can I learn from oak about dealing with this stuff? What can I learn from cedar about dealing with this? What can I learn from my local river about dealing with these times when I want to flow, but I'm super frozen and I have to just wait for the situation to turn into whatever it's going to turn into. That thing. So this season can help us a lot <laughs> with that stuff. Um, the parts of this process that are frustrating, that are, um, that, that are destabilizing and calcifying at the same time. Um, this whole season is kind of here to say, hey, we've got this. This happens over and over and over again. And it happens to everybody. It even happens to the gods and goddesses. Even they have to put up with this. <laughs> so you can do it. You've got to find your way that you're going to do it, but you can do this. I'm always excited for in bulk season. Um, partly because I know spring comes after it, but partly because this is like the portion of the wheel that I almost feel like it's not even just permitted, but required that we daydream, that we fantasize, that we reach for things that are incredibly utopian and idyllic and, um, and ridiculous, foolish, even you might say, um, the universe is like, yeah, why not? Like, let's try, <laughs> you know, when I go to pick my seeds in spring, don't I want to have the most widest, bizarre, incredible variety of seeds to pick from? Where might those seeds start 
could be here. Okay. So as we are working with this stuff, as we are moving through these ideas, um, experiencing them, trying to process and integrate this information, uh, we have deities that are on our side that are here to help us to sit with the ice and the fire of, of in bulk season. Because the other half of what we're doing is waking up. We are dreaming. We are asleep. But that's different from dead. You get me? Death is like really still. We're not dead anymore. We're coming back. And or going forward, right? There's no going back. <laughs> We're going forward into the next form. So something's moving. Our cells are moving. Something's creeping under the soil, under the frost. Something is wriggling around and, and changing shape and moving. Um, so there is this element of dreaming. But there's some type of fire. Some type of spark is being stoked here. Some type of heat is is being engendered from within from this still cold waking up into the spark waking up into what the spark is going to catch waking up into what that fire might be when we hit airy season and spring equinox okay so the deities that we get to work with at this time um fall into a bunch of different categories but I think the two big ones are Brigid and Kaleh. Pardon me while I take a sip of some water because I've been yammering for 24 minutes. <laughs> Brigid and Kaleh, incredible deities. Um, Brigid's name is also Bride or Breed. Yes, that is where we get those words from, is from her name. She is the bringer of fire. She is the bright one, the great one, the fiery arrow. She oversaw healing, prophecy, skills, warfare, poetry, childbirth, marriage, arts, smithing, like blacksmithing and metalsmithing. And she protects houses. And here she's depicted in her healer aspect here she's depicted in her poet aspect. I love these illustrations. And this is Kaleic. Kaleic is thought of as her opposite. And in some systems, it's thought that Kaleic and Brigid are perhaps the same goddess. One the cold side, one the hot side, one the winter, one the summer kind of a thing. Kaleic guards rivers, springs, hills, mountains. She controls the weather. She protects elk and deer. Uh, boars, mountain goats, and cattle, and wolves. She is incredibly ancient. She is an embodiment of the crone. And this is a goddess form or a goddess energy that we've been talking about throughout winter. The crone basically shows up right around Samhain, the end of Samhain. Um, really during Sagittarius season is kind of when the crone shows up. And um, the crone is an embodiment of death transition uh she's an embodiment of that stillness that we were talking about endings but also the crone is an embodiment of wisdom and an embodiment of enlightenment and it is the goddess in her crone form in many of our belief systems around the planet who is the quote-unquote mother of the god or goddess that is being born or reborn or waking up from their nap or waking up to their enlightenment at winter solstice. And isn't that an interesting thing, right? We always think of the mother goddesses as being the mothers. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's reasonable. But it's actually the crone goddesses that are birthing the great matriarchs and patriarchs of the religious and philosophical systems of Earth. Because they themselves are an embodiment of wisdom. They are an embodiment of enlightenment. Um, I think I've got one more Bridget here. This is Bridget as the Smith. Um, I love these. So good. Another Bridget as the Smith. And the scroll in their hand for their poetry. Note the tulips. 
and the snowdrops, flowers that we see here uh, at this time of year. So other deities that we might um, work with at this time of year fall into the categories of um, death, death deities, crone deities, fate and fortune deities, storm and weather deities, uh, deities that oversee or protect water sources, oceans, rivers, wells, springs, streams, all of those types of places. Deities that oversee uh, the teaching of a trade or in particular skills and crafts big time with, um, with Bridget. Um, deities that oversee purification and purification rituals. Um, hearth and stove and fire deities, but particularly not just fire deity, like not just any fire deities, right? We're not seeing Pele necessarily being worshipped at this time of year as a volcanic, you know, fire deity. But um, hearth deities, like there's a holiday to Vesta during in bulk season is a perfect example. And lots of others. We're going to talk uh, about a few. Uh, this week, just uh, a couple days ago in, in the podcast, we were talking about the Chinese deity um, Zhao Shen, who is the stove god, literally the kitchen god, the stove god. Um so the deity of the hearth, a.k.a. the heart of the home, the heated heart of the, of the home of the family. Literally the stove, but also that archetypal place. Um, deities that oversee midwifery, um, psychopomps, basically the same thing. And deities that oversee initiations or beginnings of processes, uh, but specifically initiation of the self, not necessarily like the initiation of a, of a business or something. Um, and then our archetypal figures that we're working with um, in our culture uh, that bring us into that place are our tradespeople, our craftspeople, our midwives, um, and our psychopomps are people that help us cross over the edge and come back again. So I think that probably qualifies for a lot of therapists and counselors and psychologists and psychiatrists. Um, all of our oracles and our fate readers, so our tarot readers, our astrologers, our rune and bone readers, and all of those folks that kind of cross the threshold and come back with information for us. These are all of our um, archetypal humans that we are working with at this time of year. Um, if I didn't say teachers, teachers, hi. <laughs> um, and uh, deities that are slowly returning to light. So we talked a bit about Bridget and Calaic as these like very specific goddesses that we can work with at this time of year. In general, um, when we are working with uh, the goddess and the god as pagans for this time of year, we want to think about the goddess slowly waking up and like sitting strongly in their crone energy and then beginning the process of transforming forward into the maiden. Oh, right. That's what happens with the goddess at spring. Oh, <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> That's actually pretty cool. Not trans back, trans forward into the next form, which is... An embodiment of newness and I don't know any better. How cool is that? That the goddess is moving from I'm literally the embodiment of I know <laughs> to the embodiment of I have no idea. <laughs> we get to flip over our cards and refresh our shit whenever we want to. It's actually pretty cool. <laughs> so the goddess is going to be slowly changing from the crone energy into uh, forward into maiden energy. Um, we could say that she is pregnant with the potential of spring. Um, that might be weird energy for some folks, but she is, or they are, carrying the energy forward to spring. All of those uh, embodiment, not all, a lot of the embodiment deities are going to change forward into a deity that doesn't actually know better, which I love, I love, I love it. Um, and then the light and solar power are rising. As we talked about at the beginning of class, um, the sun is slowly making its way back north. Half a degree, one degree, whatever it is on the horizon, day by day, little by little. A couple of more minutes in the sky every day. Um, 
Uh, it's still cold outside, but animals and vegetation are waking up and the days are getting longer. The Oak King, who is in power from uh, winter solstice to summer solstice, is rising or gaining in power. Um, that is happening. <laughs> so how have pagans been observing this? Um, we've talked a lot about the general concepts and the theories of Imbolc. Kind of give you a little bit of a sermon there to start class. Welcome. Uh, if it's your first time, <laughs> queen of the tangents. <laughs> um, so we've talked a lot about the theories of Imbolc. And we've talked about the deity forms that kind of oversee our Imbolc work. Um, generally the kind of work we're doing during this season and some particular deities that we might work with. But how do pagans or how have we and how do we observe this for ourselves? Well, let's get into it. I guess I could have had that up for the for part of that talk. Oops. Oh, well. <laughs> Um, purification of self, restoration of natural resources, which we will talk about as well. Uh, initiations, honoring craftspeople, healers, midwives, learning a new skill and returning to your spiritual practice. So our themes um, for working with this, actually, I thought, there we go. Whoops, put that slide in the wrong spot. It happens. Um, here are some other names for uh, in bulk slash other holidays that are happening literally at the same time or practically at the same time. Um, so we have Imbolga uh, is how this is pronounced. It's another way of saying in bulk. Um, in bulk, old Irish, Imbolga is modern Irish, and it means in the belly. And it is relating to that newly pregnant goddess imagery or idea that we were talking about. Um, oi milk is another word that is used for this holiday, and this is Gaelic, and it means ewes milk. Now, this to me is really trippy. Imfolk is Old Irish, and it means to wash or cleanse oneself. Back to that purification thing that we were talking about there, right? And this in turn, Imfork is related to a Proto-Indo-European root word meaning both milk and to cleanse. Now, what's up with all this milk stuff? Well, a lot of mammals during Imbolc season are going to give birth to their first or their only baby for the year. And there will be, as I like to say in the classes, much lactation. <laughs> So the idea that the word milk is embedded in the words that we use for this holiday, very cool because we have a lot of, of milk being produced to raise babies that were born or about to be born or, you know, happened in some way, spiritually or otherwise, because of winter solstice. <laughs> um, but also, there's something here about milk potentially being connected to the idea of washing oneself, purifying oneself, something along those lines. Cool connections there. Okay, other names that we see here, Thoroblot, Bari, Disting, uh, as well as Dizablot, these are all uh, Norse and Teutonic and Germanic words. Um, uh, some of these are still happening in forms today. Some of them uh, are very much from the past, but they all are these sort of midwinter sacrifice, midwinter ceremony um, happening approximately here at the beginning of February. Apelia is a pretty uh, popular holiday from Scotland. Um, a about a thousand people get together, dress up as Vikings, run around town and harangue people, uh, get super drunk, and then set a full-size Viking ship on fire. Just pagan stuff, honestly. It's not a big deal. It's just casual Tuesday evening in Shetland, Scotland. <laughs> you gotta love it. Um, other names for this day, La Favride. 
uh, or La Al uh, these are Scottish Gaelic and Irish and Manx names for the day of bride or the day of breed or the day of Bridget, um, the festival or the feast of Bridget. Uh, Brigantia from our Celtic uh, friends and ancestors, the feast of the goddess Brigid, the feast of St. Brigid. And Brigantia and St. Brigid are totally not connected to Brigid. They totally are. Um, there's a lot of folks that are like, St. Brigid is a totally different person. And there's a lot of folks that are like, the Brigid may have literally been a goddess, but St. Brigid did exist and took on a lot of the characteristics and um, symbolism and, and jobs of goddesses or uh, priestesses that would have been in the employ of, uh, Bridget. Um, so yeah, there's that, uh, interesting stuff around St. Bridget. Um, she's a really, 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 uh, incredibly powerful or not powerful, but, um, popular saint for a lot of people. And I think it's because she carries so much of Bridget with her. Brigantia is where the country Britain gets its name from. <laughs> and Brigantia absolutely is uh, a, is a na another word for Brigid. Okay. So these are the big holidays. What is it that people were doing at these things? Well, here are some of my favorite, favorite Favorite parts of this class because it gets crazy and cool. Okay, first off, we have candle making like a mug. Um, candle making, filling the house with candles, filling the house with light, sort of celebrating fire, but also celebrating the making or the fostering of fire. So if you know any candle makers, now is a nice time to say thank you. Uh, I mean, come on, witches, we burn a lot of candles. So you better be friends with a candle maker. And if you're not, you should send a letter of thanks to your company that makes your favorite candles. Because <laughs> it's good. It's it's good spiritual practice at this time of year. Um, if you have never made your own candles, you might be adventurous and want to try that for this season. Side note, don't sue me. It's dangerous and it's easy to melt stuff and set things on fire. That said, it's fun and cool uh, <laughs> and, and uh, definitely something that even up to, you know, a hundred years ago was a completely normal chore in most households and is still a normal chore in plenty of households around the world. This is still something that people have to do for themselves all the time. Um, and it's hard and it's messy and it's dangerous. It's, it's hot. It's easy to burn yourself. It's easy to make a mess. Um, and yet you are making fire. Pretty cool stuff. <laughs> um, but this is absolutely a, a traditional symbol of uh, in bulk season, gathering candles, burning lots of candles and making candles. But we would be remiss if we did not mention the super wacky pagan tradition of literally putting burning candles on your head. <laughs> I love it. It's so good. This is an incredibly traditional in bulk practice. We have this lovely person here modeling a very fancy uh, crown or headpiece that's clearly made to hold these candles. Uh, and yes, in the tradition, the candles are real. Do I do that? Absolutely not. I am way too clumsy. Uh, <laughs> abs no, no. <laughs> what I've done is I made a strip of white shimmery sheer material and measured it out as a headband put a little elastic in it so it would stay up on my head. And I got a tiny little battery pack twinkle light string on a wire that's a nice cool white, not a warm white, but a cool white. Um, and put that in there. And I wear that for my in bulk rituals when I'm doing them with other people or if I'm just feeling like being fancy for myself. Um, I do not wear candles on my head. God has blessed those who go that that extreme. That's, that's they're going hard there in in some of the uh, pagan traditions. <laughs> and this is something that is seen throughout like northern central Europe, uh, still practiced today by lots of pagans. 
still practiced today by lots of Catholics as well, who are celebrating candle mass on this day. This is absolutely something that a lot of European Catholics will do in their candle mass celebrations. Note the holly and the berries uh, in this wreath. Pretty cool. Um, other stuff. Priapic wands. Uh, this is a very cool, fun, and ultimately raunchy practice. Uh, thanks, pagans. Gotta keep it filthy, right? Um, these priapic wands represent the surging, the rising god energy, thrust energy. And I guess I should have talked about this at the beginning of class. When I'm, see, tangent, when I'm talking about goddess, quote-unquote, energy, in terms of our sexual power and all of that stuff. Sure, yes, vaginas are involved sometimes, but really I'm talking about an energy that all humans have access to, that draws in, that gestates, that holds, that yearns, that pulls in, that magnetizes things to it. Um, it's, it's a more introverted energy. It is not exclusively feminine or masculine or anything like that. It's an energy that all humans can have access to. And when I'm talking about God energy, what I'm talking about really, yes, again, sometimes we do mean literally penises, but sometimes, a lot of the time, we're talking about that energy in all humans that thrusts, that pushes out, that's extroverted, that goes and gets what it wants, that shows up that rises to the occasion, right? <laughs> that thing. Um, and so priapic wands are uh, magical wands that occur naturally. You want to go to your local evergreen that is um, shedding at this time of year and look for branches that have fallen off and it has to have fallen off the tree. You can't cut it off. You can't break it off. It has to fall off naturally that naturally has a pine cone occurring at the end. This actually happens all the time. It is not as rare as it sounds unless you live deep, deep, deep in the city and you don't have any conifers anywhere near you, then it might be a little difficult to find this. You might have to actually go to the woods. Um, but generally speaking, uh, uh, this is something that's actually pretty common, uh, especially as our seasons change and we are moving through these weeks of Imbolc and we have our storms and our weather roll in, these, li these little branches are gonna get broken off. So just keep your eyes open. Um, kind of a cool thing that this is a, a, a magical symbol and a magical tool of the holiday that you wanna make during the holiday. You shouldn't necessarily have it ready at the beginning of the holiday. However, if you do manage to find one and have it, you can certainly keep it year after year. Um, but you know, one of those things. What else are pagans doing at this time of year? We are going to sacred wells, our water sources, our uh, waterways around us, and we are cleaning them up. We are doing dedications. We might do some type of a sacrifice. And of course, sacrifice is just a giving of energy. It does not have to be any form in particular. Um, putting water or putting fre bringing fresh water to water, um, picking up trash, um, advocating for not only the natural waterways and water sources around you, but the indigenous groups that are water protectors in your area. Do you know um, what the water protection laws are in your area? All of that work is holy work at this time of year. You are su supported and, and uh, promoted by the gods and goddesses in pursuing that kind of work in this time of year. Because again, all of these are these systems that are coming back to life. And these are the systems that, that promote our capacity to be able to grow our stuff in spring, metaphorically and physically. We have to have healthy waterways if we're gonna have healthy gardens if we're going to grow healthy food, to be healthy people, to do healthy shit in the world. Just that. Just that. <laughs> yeah, you didn't realize it was going to be a big leftist rant. Well, welcome. <laughs> this, this is actually my brand. <laughs> 
what else are pagans doing at this time of year? Uh, a side note to the wells, we've already had one um, saint day come up, uh, and we haven't even had Imbolc yet, but as but we already had, uh, you know, the sun move into Aquarius. So as far as the holy days are concerned, Imbolc season has already kicked off. We've already had one saint day that is dedicated specifically to a, a sacred well and its, its maintenance. Um, okay. What else are pagans doing at this time of year? Candles. Whoops. All right. We know. Okay. Wait, is that everything? No, it's not. Here we go. Ha ha. The distaff. Okay. I, I love these things and I didn't, oh, I've had so many, so many trips with this symbol. <laughs> I'm such a weirdo, <laughs> but I've had so many trips with this symbol. Um, the distaff is this incredible magical item and completely normal tool that you find in the house. As we find, pushing back into history, a lot of our magical tools are, right? The broom, for example, the cauldron, um, completely normal. No, I'm just cooking stuff. Your soul. Okay. So, <laughs> so the distaff, um, is this rod of various sizes. Sometimes they're really short. Sometimes they're really, really tall and long. And it is in the mundane sense, uh, used for gathering wool and holding it. And then a string of wool is pulled out and brought into a drop spinner. It's, it's, it's pulled out and, and spun into a thread that is then um, on a spindle. And then you're from there, you're going to be able to knit things with that or make a rug or whatever it is that you're going to do with it. But it's basically taking this giant bundle of, of chaos um, and spinning it into something. Now, I we we love this size queen. Go girl, get yours. Okay, but look at the top here, we have our big staff in the upright corner, right? And this giganto wad of wool. And then you can see in her hand right there where the copyright so thanks whoever I stole this from. Um where she's taking the thread or she's taking the wool, spinning it in her hand and then continuing to spin it and gather it with her other hand onto the spindle. Here's another person getting it started. And this is another form that we see the, the top of the distaff, the shape that's at the top, uh, is actually important. And, um, I have not been able to learn enough about these staves to know exactly where these various shapes came from, why one was in one, you know, why, why did one person use this shape and somebody else used that shape? But you will see just a normal stick like this with some ridges and grooves on it that are enough to grab the wool. And then you'll see this sort of double egg shape, which, hey, doesn't that kind of look like an infinity symbol? Hmm, interesting. Um, and the wool or whatever the material is would be gathered there and then pulled down and spun into thread. Sometimes you'll see it like this where it's just a big wad, but then there's this like fancy or wrapping to sort of keep things in control. And then from there you see the person pulling out bits to, to, um, we, to, uh, work it into a string. This is another way of doing it where you have like your bundle on your hand and you don't have that big pole, the big, the big distaff. You just have the spindle. Um, this is Greece, ancient Greece. I don't know, 1200 years ago, something like that. This is the Hittites, approximately 800 BCE. Same thing. We see two people working the thread. Here's another person. They've got that bundle at the top and they're dropping it down into the spindle. This is approximately 1910 Iraq. I love this partly because, hello, that's a beefy boy. Come on. <laughs> Are there any kids watching? I apologize. That's... <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Trust, when I found that picture, I was like, 
<laughs> We're going to have a good winter. It's going to be fine. We're Everybody's going to be fine. We're all going to stay nice and toasty. <laughs> but we have this very suggestive, but really quite symbolically accurate, right? Wad of wool here getting ready to be spun on a wheel. Um, the, so, you know, uh, automating some of the process, but also bringing some other magical symbolism. This is another person. I couldn't find any information on this picture, um, so I don't know where or when this is from. It could be from 10 years ago. It could be from 100 years ago. Um, not really sure. But why I grabbed it is because this is another style of distaff that we will see. Sometimes, as I said, it's just a stick with grooves on it grabbing the wool. Sometimes it's this egg shape that everything is spun around, but sometimes we have these forked distaffs. And the forked distaff is also called a stang. Um, and the egg distaff, I don't know if it has its own special name or not. But these two in particular, the forked distaff and the egg-shaped distaff, we see in magical practices a lot. And we see them as holy symbols that women carry specifically, or the high femme of the village, or the high, the high woman, or the high, per, you know, femme person, or goddess-centered person um, of the village, of the tribe, of the community, of the whatever. So... One idea that has sort of presented itself as I work with this material, interestingly, um, is really thinking about the symbolism that we're working at Yule and how does that move into in bulk and then how does that move into spring, right? Because it's always connected. And I really thought a lot about that bundle of chaos in the at the top of the distaff, right? And... You know, it, it's all unformed. It's uh, it's undone, which is very much the energy that we're working with in Yule season, right? We have Saturnalia. We have all of these holidays that are like up is down, black is white. Oh, MG, even the gods are dead. Like, what's going on? And chaos, right? Disorder. And then we have Epiphany, and we have like which is like the the twelve days of Christmas and all of that stuff. Um, that's witnessed in a bunch of different religions, but it, it they basically are sort of this like energetic door slamming <laughs> on the part of humans that are like, okay, look, we're done with this winter chaos business. We're, we're putting order to things now. We're going to put stuff back where it belongs. Like what the hell is going on? And, and to have these holidays here at this time period where it's like, no, we're specifically taking the chaos and we are spinning it into order. We are taking this from who knows what it is and we're turning it into something. It can't be nothing. It's got to be something. Now, side note to me, of course, because this is me, I also thrill at the symbolism of these women holding their staff and spinning <laughs> if you know, you know, <laughs> come on. It's like right in front of us sometimes. And I'm like, it's almost rude. It's kind of tacky, but hello, uh, I'm drawing from above, right? And I'm bringing it down into the physical plane in a form that is something that we can all use. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Um, just had to go off for a minute on all of that stuff. Uh, oh, I can't. It's so good. It's so good. Thinking about now, again, think about that symbolism of pulling from above and bringing it down into something that's useful. Right? Oh, it's so good. Like, what is that? What are we doing now? Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Okay. Let us move on because this has been incredibly fun, but we have so, so many other things to talk about. So let's move on. <laughs> um, we have talked about our main themes. We've talked about our gods and goddesses. We have talked about our big holidays that pagans are celebrating at this time of year, past and present. Um, and some of the forms and some of the key forms of celebration. Um, not all of them, but some. 
So now I want to quickly look at um, some of our global themes. You have to apo I have to apologize because we're going to have to scooch back and forth because I got these in the, um, the wrong order. <laughs> it happens sometimes. All right. Hey, not bad. Okay. So we are... <laughs> Water. <laughs> Participate. Okay. When we look out around the planet and we look out to see what else everybody else has been doing and is doing currently, what kind of stuff do we see? Very similar themes happening past and present around the planet. Awakening the body, awakening vitality, purification, renewal, rededication to spiritual traditions. Okay, so at this time of year, some of the other holidays that you'll see celebrated past and present are Lene, which is a Greek festival for water spirits, Hadaka Matsuri from our Shinto friends, which is a purifying festival, Terminalia from our Roman ancestors. This is literally the end of the year. It is the termination of the old year. Um, the Olakun Festival from our Yoruba friends, the Feast of Rhiannon from our Welsh friends, Thai Pusam, which is a Malaysian purification festival. If you can handle um, extreme mortification content, check out photos of the Thai Pusam um, events. They put Carnival to shame. I'm just going to say that. I mean, God has blessed Carnival, but whew, these cats go for it. Um, and then we also see the lesser Eleusinian mysteries happen at this year. And that is, um, a whole, uh, holiday cycle that happens around reopening the underworld where sacrifices and offerings were put last year at the end of, uh, a harvest festival and bringing out this, uh, oh, fall this rot these rotted um, sacrifices and offerings to make compost that is then going to be brought out to the fields and scattered before the first seeds are put in. So good. Okay, so we would be remiss to not mention, in particular, a few really potent um, holidays that are happening at this time of year, past and present. First off. We have Lunar New Year, which is a global holiday slash Asian, um, but literally this is something that is celebrated by billions of people. Always falling on the new moon between January 20th and February 20th. This time point is observed by billions of people in Asia and around the world by cleaning their homes, reuniting with family, worshiping ancestors, and of course, shooting off fireworks. Uh, the Chinese New Year is celebrated on the second new moon after the winter solstice. So if you've ever wondered how to calculate that, now you know. Um, if you have a Lunar New Year celebration happening in your town, go check it out. It is dope. It is educational. It's going to be awesome. You're going to eat great food. You're going to meet cool people. You're going to see amazing stuff, really cool artists and dancers and performers. It's awesome. Um, and I have deep, deep respect for the Asian communities that continue to celebrate Lunar New Year, despite it being totally different from the calendar that, that uh, you know, directs uh, the West. Um, because this is just an incredibly old celebration. So we really have an awesome opportunity to participate in something that is incredibly old, incredibly old, really cool stuff. All right. Also at this time of year from our Hindu friends, we have Vasant Panchami. This is the Hindu festival marking the pre-funk of spring, dedicated to Saraswati, the great goddess of creativity and skills and talents. Millions of Hindus wear bright yellow clothes, eat yellow foods, fly kites, and shop for school supplies and begin to get ready for the epic festival Holi, which happens 40 days later. Holi, of course, is sort of the spring New Year celebration for Hindus. Um, from our Roman friends and ancestors, as well as modern pagans, we have Lupercalia, which I will be going into much greater depth <laughs> as we get into the holiday. Not in this class, later on. Uh, but I do have a piece up on my website you can go and read about this um, perverted, perverted, it's wonderful. Uh, okay, so this is the Roman Purification and Fertility Festival featuring nearly naked priests 
running through the streets, whipping people with leather thongs to wake up their spirits, and of course their libidos, after the freeze of winter. Folks who wanted to get pregnant made sure to expose plenty of skin. <laughs> or just wanted to, you know, get whipped because God has blessed the BDSM community. <laughs> Um, throughout February, February, we have, uh, the Pawamu from our Hopi friends, Midwinter Dream Festival from our Iroquois friends and ancestors, and the Chatek Shell Ha, uh, which is the Midwinter Festival from our Oneida friends and ancestors. These are all Native American festivals held at this time of year. They each span several holidays and are usually connected to the lunar movements, um, all festivals take time to honor ancestors and feast with loved ones, check in with community. Um, a lot of these festivals, um, uh, well, I don't want to say that because I'm not insert. I'm, I'm actually not certain if that's true about this collection of festivals. So I'm going to shut up. Um, special focus is on dancing with star goddesses and star goddesses are a big deal for a lot of, uh, different groups around the planet at this time of year waking up the land and blessing seeds and cleansing equipment for a good growing season. And then of course, we also have, of course, Carnival, Mardi Gras, and Lent. The Catholic Church's annual global Bacchanal and purification ritual. Billions of practitioners are encouraged to indulge in the sweet life and then purify through abstinence and mortification for the next 46-ish days, which delivers you to Easter. Um, and Carnival, Mardi Gras, and Lent are not always part specifically of Imbolc season. Sometimes they happen much later in the calendar, and the majority of that actually falls during uh, Ostara or spring equinox season. So it really kind of carries from the winter vibes into the spring vibes different uh different for each year because of it's dictated by the lunar movements not solar all right so that is a lot of information but we are not done <laughs> um oh wait well yeah we're going here but i'm not ready i'm not ready yet relax um uh, but we're just about to get there <laughs> Um, so now we are going to get more into the technical stuff behind these holidays. Um, we've talked a lot about pagans. What are they doing? Why? Um, who might they be worshiping or what gods or archetypes might they be working with or being inspired by or looking to for advice or guidance? Um, what cultural holidays and practices do we see? We talked about some of that stuff, uh, both for pagans as well as everybody else around the planet. So now I want to dive a little bit more into the, ultimately the magical side, the, the witchcraft, the ritual side of all of this stuff and the deep symbolism of a lot of this stuff. And so for that, we are going to turn to the skies and talk for a moment about astronomy and then astrology and then tarot. So, um, let me go back to this. These in a sense, are our in bulk constellations that we are working with. Um, in February, our full moons, uh, excuse me, our new moons are going to be in Aquarius and Pisces. In March, our full moons are going to be in Pisces or Aries. The sun is also passing through these constellations. Now, there's a little astrology astronomy for you. Wherever the sun is, is where the new moons are going to be. So if the sun is in Aquarius, the new moon is also going to be in Aquarius. Sun's in Pisces, our new moon is also going to be in Pisces. Once the sun changes, that means we're automatically switching signs and we're going to go to the next set. Wherever the, the whatever is opposite those signs is where our full moons are going to be. So in February as the sun is moving through Aquarius and Pisces, the full moons are going to be in Leo and Virgo. And in March, 
as the sun moves through Pisces and then Aries, our full moons are going to be in Virgo and Libra. And that matters for the astrology. We'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. But um, blah, 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 what do I want to say about that? Uh, the most important thing I think to say about that stuff really is that the last full moon of winter is known as the worm moon or the Lenten moon. And yes, that does connect back to Lent because no matter what, Lent will have kicked in by March. Um, last full moon of winter, always. Okay, so here's what I want to say about these constellations and such. We have Aquarius and we have Pisces. Aquarius is known as the water bearer. And um, three of the uh, fixed stars that are associated with this constellation uh, are really important. Sadal Melek, excuse me, Sadal Melek, uh, the luck of the king. Sadal Sud, the luckiest of the lucky. And Scott, the wish. Now, some people see uh, the constellation of Aquarius as a person pouring out a jug. Some people see a jug just pouring out. It's always water. Some folks see a mountain range with melt coming down the mountain range. So it's snowy at the top and then that's melting and the water is rushing down, which eventually are going to come into the rivers and the plains, right? So looking at the source of the water is really what we're talking about here. It's either a person with a jug or the jug itself or literally a mountain range with snow cap that is melting. But whatever it is that we're looking at in Aquarius, we are also looking at something that kind of symbolizes the source of the water. However you want to frame that in your mind. Yes, just to keep things confusing, Aquarius is an air sign. So don't get, don't get that twisted. We'll, let's, We'll get into that when we get to the astrology part. But there's something about a pouring out or the source of the thing that's being poured out. Okay. Then we move over to Pisces, also known as the fishes, also known as the dolphin. Pisces is also Typhon, is also connected to the goddess Tiamat, um, who uh, is kind of a big deal in spring equinox. Coming up next. Hmm, convenient. Now, our noted um, fixed stars for the constellation of Pisces are Alferg, the cord, or pouring water. Alresha, or Alresha, both are correct. Down at the crux, or the very point in the bottom uh, left, uh, that means the knot. And then... Uh, we have Fumal Salmek, or excuse me, the Fumal Salmek is the mouth of the fish. That's technically the first one that we're seeing. Um, Alferg, the cord or pouring water, and then the knot is down in the corner, Alresha or Alresha. Now, if Aquarius is pouring out, in theory, uh, Pisces is drinking it in. Right? We have the mouth of the fish with Fum al Salmaka, mouth of the fish. Aquarius is dispensing something or pouring something out. And Pisces, the constellation of Pisces, is taking it in. And then something happens at Alresha and it shoots up. Now, some people see the constellation of Pisces as two fish that are tied together with a string, hence the idea of the cord um, and, and them being tied together. Why are they tied together? I don't know. There are myths that connect to that stuff, but I think the more important symbolism here to focus on is that Aquarius is a constellation that is pouring out and Pisces is a constellation that is drinking it in and taking it in. Okay. Now, another thing that I think is interesting about this, about Pisces, is that some people see the constellation of Pisces as a type of depiction of the cross. The cross is a symbol that has a lot of baggage, um, so let's not. But we see the cross 
as a magical symbol that means manifestation. Manifestation on the earth plane. And some folks see the constellation of Pisces as having one bar that is horizontal and one bar that is vertical, like a cross, equal armed or otherwise. And here we see that Aquarius is pouring something out onto the physical plane, right? It's in alignment with that horizontal-ish bar. And then something happens and there is this manifestation moment where the thing becomes flesh. Very similar to our symbolism that we're working with with the crone, right? Of being the embodiment of enlightenment. The embodiment of the wisdom. The physical manifestation of the idea. Well, here now we are seeing that ultimately play out as we move through winter into its, you know, last eight weeks, basically, of moving through Aquarius and then moving into Pisces before spring equinox. Something is being poured out. Something is being received, and then it's being acted on and manifested. Cool stuff. Okay. While we are working with this time of year, we have uh, this year, um, we'll talk about this more in the podcast. We don't have time in this class, unfortunately, to get really deep into this stuff. But this year uh, in, in bulk season, we have a black new moon on January 31st because the new moon happens for us in the West while it's still January and it is February for a lot of other people around the planet. So for us in the West, we get two new moons in January, no new moons in February and two new moons in March. So that second new moon of the month is called a black new moon. Um, we also have the heliacal rising of the fixed star Deneb al -Gedi. We'll talk about that more in the podcast. We don't have time right now. Uh, we see migrations begin to kick in all over the planet as beings begin to head uh, north again. Um, many rivers and waterways are surging as Earth slowly melts and we step into storm season again. Uh, which is why we see lots of deities that oversee storms and weather at this time. And as I said before, mammals begin delivering their first or only babies of the year, and there is much lactation. <laughs> okay. Let us now move on to the astrology. Actually, let me do this. That... Let me show you that very briefly. Um, these are our holy dates of note, the big ones anyways, for this year's in bulk season. These will not be the same for every year. I'll leave that up for just a second for you guys. Mercury D. No, perverts. Um, Mercury stations direct because currently Mercury is in retrograde and it is uh, stationing direct on February 3rd. We'll talk about this more in the podcast as well. Okay. Now let us move on to our astrology. Um, Oh, hi. Oh, my gosh. I have a uh, side note. Sorry. <laughs> Pause here for just a second. Hello, hello, hello to everybody that's here. Oh, my gosh. There's so many comments here. Um, I have a little thing up that was supposed to be showing me comments and it didn't. So I apologize. I haven't seen. <laughs> um, where are these Bridget images from? Uh, I will send you an email or I will try to find them, try to find the information about that before uh, we are done with class. I think I have it written down actually um, because I wanted to say the name of the artist, but of both of the artists. Um, oh, oh, here we go. Um, hey, see, I knew I had it written somewhere. I'm glad I checked the, <laughs> the comments. Um, Helen Mask at Mask Illustration. That's Helen H-E-L-E-N, mask, M-A-S-K, at mask illustration. Uh, Gemma Jones, G-E-M-M-A, Jones, J-O-N-E-S. Uh, I believe uh, Helen Mask, mask illustration, uh, did the one picture 
where uh, Bridget has the um, hammer over their shoulder. And I believe Gemma Jones did the other three. Um, and then the picture of Kaleich, I believe, is by Dan Goodfellow. Uh, G-O-O-D-F-E-L-L-O-W. Goodfellow. Um, but thanks to everybody. Hi, hi, hi. Yay. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Stupid chat. <sighs> Robots. I tell you what. If they weren't so cute. All right. Um, so for our astrology work, um, bust out ye old natal charts. Um, and the portion of the wheel that we are working through, if we were to superimpose the wheel over your natal chart, the portion of the wheel that we are working with that corresponds to your natal chart is going to be the portion covered by Aquarius and Pisces. So wherever that is in your chart, that's where the sun is moving through and that's where we're going to have our new moons. Is this a particularly easy part of the year for you? Is it a particularly hard part of the year? Do you have some planets hanging out here or do you have some planets that aspect this part of your chart in some way? Side note, come see me for a reading. We can talk about it. But um, all your new moons are going to be here and the sun is moving through here. Uh, conversely, opposite side of the chart Wherever you have Leo and Virgo are where your full moons are going to be. Leo, full moon during Aquarius season. Virgo is the full moon during Pisces season. So, as the sun travels through Aquarius, our focus moves away from the external and the material world to an inner experience where we drift in a gray liminal space as winter winds on, floating in alternate pasts, alternate presents, alternate futures, and connecting temporarily to archetypal concepts much larger than us is super potent work at this time of year. The mind is out front, and it's a great time to connect with the universe for a cosmic download or several, while we are drifting in this dreamy space, dreaming of whatever it is that we're going to become in spring. So with our new moon in Aquarius, um, we are going to take some private time to critically examine and call out any traditional beliefs, traditional patterns, traditional attitudes that have been handed to you, that you have inherited from your family, from the people who raised you, um, and that might be culturally raising you as well as literally parenting you, um, from the people who showed you how the world is, right? Oftentimes we inherit really funky f stuff from those people. And usually those people mean well, not always. Sometimes those systems and those people are actually trying to make it bad for you or, or give you a, a slanted, uh, version of what is actually the truth. But a lot of times you know, it's a grandpa that really meant well, or it's an old aunt, right? Or, or, you know, a cousin who's seen some shit, right? And they're, they're, they're trying to help you. They think that they're trying to help you. They think that they're trying to keep you from having the bad time that they had. But oftentimes what they're also giving you is their cynicism and their bitterness and their, their pessimism, their paranoia, um, their sadness, their fear around their experience and how it went for them. Um, and so we want to question that stuff. What are the traditions that I follow and who told me this was a good idea? What was their motivation? Where did I get that stuff from? That's a lot of what we want to be doing as we're drifting out there during Aquarius season because we want to be able to name those biases when it comes time to act, right? And go, oh, wait, I don't want to go through this cycle again. I was told by my dad or my mom or my whoever right? My drag mom, my whoever, that this is just the way things are and I have to do it this way. It's the best way. It's the only way. I'm going to dream up another way. I just am. I'm going to. But that starts with naming it. That starts with becoming aware of the fact that there's a pattern there in the first place. Okay. And then two weeks later, when we work with our full moon in Leo, we want to allow the mother or the queen energy in us to step up and take charge. 
Um, we want to honor those around us also that, that stand in that place of power, that stand in that place of responsibility and authority. These are the people who teach us how to do stuff. These are the t people who show us skills um, that share their, um, their crafting ideas with us, their skill sets with us, um, that coach us in things, that initiate us into leveling up into the next better version of ourself, more realized version of ourself. So witnessing that energy in yourself and honoring the people in your community that are playing that role for you. And then we head into Pisces season. And in Pisces, we swim in a sea of potential. We begrudgingly, for some, <laughs> turn away from the infinite cosmos and we begin the process of choosing from the possibilities of what our new life in spring could look like. And so for that new moon in Pisces, we want to turn inward um, one final time. It's not the only, it's not the last moment of reflection that we're going to have in the year, right? But it's, it's the last moments of winter at this point. We're in those last weeks, those last days of winter at this point. Um, and so for the new moon in Pisces, we want to turn inward a final time before the riotous growth of spring begins. We want to dream, we want to fantasize, and we want to imagine the new world coming for ourselves. Us first, right? And then for that full moon in Virgo, what threads of fate, past, present, and future, we're choosing to weave into the next row on the tapestry of life? Who will be served by this work? And folks that have worked with me for a long time know that I come back to that image of the tapestry over and over again. I'm certainly not the only witch or metaphysician out there that uses this image, but we all have our place at the loom. We all have our moment of responsibility where it's our turn to weave the tapestry. And every time that it's our turn to come up and help weave the tapestry, first and foremost, the only part we need to worry about is the part that's right in front of us. We don't need to worry about what anybody else is doing. So let that go. But secondly, our responsibility first and foremost starts with what's that stuff? What's that chaos that we are drawing our thread from in the first place? Is this clean? Is this good? Do I want to continue to weave this thread into the tapestry? Because as far as I'm concerned in this little space, that's my responsibility. Maybe I don't want this string here anymore, right? I get to play, I get to be that character too in this. And I take the chaos and I weave it into a new string and I weave that into the tapestry. And I'm like, nope, we're not doing it that way anymore. I know grandpa was cool and he had a great, you know, tuna casserole recipe, but he said racist stuff. We're not bringing that into the future. That's what's up. I'm, I'm, I'm cutting the thread. I'm making the decision. That's our responsibility. Um, and so in these moments, we have this dreamy, nebulous, floating place where we can really choose what are the threads that I want to work with? What are the threads that I don't think need to be carried forward anymore? That. The in-bulk season for me seems to start when the sun moves into Aquarius this sign helps open up our mind to the conversation of the self in comparison to the community, the universe, infinity, <laughs> and things that feel shared by the group at large. Our physical, spiritual, mental neighborhood, right? We are encouraged to rebel against or at least question the status quo, certainly in this day and age especially anything limiting our horizons or keeping us from expressing our unique viewpoint. While we're thinking globally, we might not be acting locally and for a moment that's okay. And I wanna clarify what I mean by this sentence. While we're thinking globally, meaning while my brain is way out there, 
we might not be acting locally, meaning I might not be posting on social media every day. I might need to go like have a retreat and go be within myself. I might need to go clean some waterways and not fucking put pictures of it on the goddamn internet. I might need to connect with some people. I might need to look into some volunteer stuff and just do it for myself and have this conversation with myself. That's what I mean by that sentence. It's a great time to go on a solo retreat, disconnect from the internet, turn inward to the self. Consider the tree that looks dead, stripped of its greenery. A broken, hollowed limb has become a home for some finches. Moss grows on the north side, but we know that there's some life deep inside. Perhaps we need to prune back some dead branches that didn't make it through winter. That's okay. Some portion of us made it through, distilled down through the melting snow. And I really want you to take that idea to heart as well in this in bulk in particular. We have been dealing with COVID for two years. Some of your branches may have broken off. It's okay. You may have a hollow in your side where some finches have moved in. That's okay. You may have gathered a little moss. That's okay. We're still here, baby. We are still here. <laughs> We're still here. As we move into Pisces, we begin to purify and wash away the parts of ourselves no longer serving the greater good. We also wake up and repair the self. And that's all of our healing and our purification work that we're doing. We are reconnecting to the systems in our environment in preparation for the shift in the energy cycle that's coming up. And that's us reconnecting with our waterways and our natural resources, making sure they're ready for action. We're ready for action. We're good to go. Do some cleanup work around your neighborhood and or a waterway or a water source near you. <laughs> what are the water protection laws in your area as we asked at the beginning of class? And so as I said before, if you're working with your natal chart, you can check out the houses that Leo and Aquarius are in as well as Pisces and Virgo. This is uh, Aquarius and Pisces where the sun is moving, where the new moons are going to be. And Leo... And Virgo are where your full moons are going to be for this season. So whatever houses uh, are connected to that, those are the parts of your life in the mundane sense that are going to be affected by this season. Um, okay, so now go ahead and bust out your tarot decks if you've got one with you. Um, and let's move into talking about... No, no, not that. Not yet. <laughs> That's for the recap. <laughs> Let's move into talking about tarot. Okay. Staying hydrated. I don't know why I'm so thirsty today. <laughs> but I but your girl is thirsty. Let's just say that. Um okay. So when we are working with tarot in this season. We have a bunch of choices. So first and foremost, uh, let's talk about working through the Aquarius portion of uh, in bulk season. And then we're going to talk about the Pisces version. And then I'm going to show you some stuff and I'm going to blow your mind. So tuck in, hike up your chonies and let's get into it. Okay. So for tarot, <laughs> while we are working with... Uh, tarot during Aquarius season, so the first half of in bulk, we are working with the star card, the fool, and then we have the five of swords, the six of swords, and the seven of swords. Not necessarily the most fun sword cards to hang out with. There's worse. That's always what I have to say about a lot of swords cards. There's worse things. Um, but what are we doing here? Well, this is where we're going to get brought back to remembering, oh yeah, there's a lot of water imagery with Aquarius, but at the end of the day, it is an air sign. Um, so there is a lot of mental work happening 
even if it doesn't seem like that on the outside. And then, uh, and I have more to say about this, but uh, I just want to show you. I just want to show you this. Here is us in Pisces portion, the Pisces season of in bulk season, the second half of in bulk, which is covered by Pisces. However you would like to say that. For Pisces, we are working with the moon. This is the card that's connected to that sign. The ruling planet of Pisces is Neptune in the modern era. Asterisk. We'll get into the other stuff in a second. Um, so hanged man. And then we have the eight, the nine, and the ten of cups. So bummer, kind of cool, super incredibly cool. Um, very fun to get the ten of cups. This is a, a lovely card to work with. So here are these entities that are here to help us. And I love working with tarot uh, as a magical system. I think of it as like supercharged flashcards where you just have so much information packed into this one image. There's so, so, so much information in there, if you know what you're looking for. Um, you know, right here off the bat with the star card, look at here's our jug pouring out water, which is the symbol of Aquarius. Etc. Etc. Okay. So let me bring it into this. The star card, actually, you know what? I'm going to have this up for you to meditate on as I present this. Here we go. The star card speaks to a potentially hard time in our life, but one that is filled with promise. Envision the captain of a ship tossed on the Black Sea, looking desperately for the North Star to guide them. When they get their bearings, they realize they are near the shore of a continent no one believes exists off the edge of the map. But that is the captain's version of the story. The other sailors think the captain has gone mad. Can a captain convince the crew to try for this new reality? Or will they abandon this course? The fool has found their guiding star and is going to follow this light no one else can see, even if, maybe especially if, it leads them off the edge of the world. And we can see here with the star and the fool, the fool is literally looking up at the star. And I think that's interesting because behind them is the sun. That's source, right? So this person or this character, this archetype in the Fool card is turning away from source and seeking their own source of inspiration. But from the outside, that might look like madness. That might look like, what are you doing? Think back to what we were talking about with our astrology work, with the idea of questioning those traditions, questioning those patterns that were given to us, even though the people that gave them to us thought they were doing their best. We could say that those things are like a map. This is the map my grandpa gave me of how the world is. This is the map my grandma gave me of how the world is. This is what my dad taught me. This is what my mom taught me. The people who took me in when my family kicked me out, they all had experiences like that too. And you know, this is what we know now about this world that thing. In this place, we're questioning that. And from the outside, a lot of people around us might look at us like we're losing it. So as we ascend from the underworld journey of winter, we have to ask ourselves what truths, what realities, what epic dreams have presented themselves that will no longer be ignored or unlived. And then also, what happens when we destabilize the calcified areas of our lives? Which again, is very much that work that we're doing here in Imbolc season, right? We've been still, we've been, de we've been calcified, and now we are destabilizing. And we're going into this place of drifting, because we're not entirely certain where we're headed yet. 
While we struggle with what our guiding star might be showing us, and we try to reconcile on a soul level what it looks like to heed that wild call, back in the mundane world, we work through how to deal with our people and ourselves when we choose to live by a philosophy that is shocking or upsetting to our people, past or present. Right? Sometimes it's the memory of grandma that's haunting us. And how we choose to communicate about it. Do we choose to communicate about it? Are we confrontational? Are we constantly apologizing because we've decided to change or grow as a person? That thing. Conversely, sometimes silence says volumes. And sometimes it is right to keep our mental chaos to ourselves. Sometimes there is something potent to letting an idea percolate and foment in the mind before sharing it with other people. But when we do speak our truth, we must have the conviction of the sacred fool who steps off the cliff. We have to believe it first before anyone else will. Sometimes when we deviate from the plan, we find our path. And now I want to show you this. The deck that we've been looking at was the Smith weight deck. Pretty familiar. These cards are from another deck called the builders of the Adidam. I am a huge fan. Uh, the decks are very inexpensive. They come on very thick card stock and they are completely black and white. And you, uh, build a relationship with the deck by painting them or coloring in the cards yourselves. Color magic is a really big deal with this deck. Um, and so I wanted to lay out the cards from that deck in a slightly different order from what we were just looking at. Um, we have, uh, here's one way of looking at things, right? We have the fool looking up at, um, at the star and saying like, oh wow, I should go on this adventure. I'm gonna turn away from source and go find my own inspiration. And then we move into Pisces season and we almost feel like we're being punished maybe, right? The the vibe between the, the hanged one and the moon card seems like dangerous or there's some kind of a warning or some kind of a like, ugh, I don't know if this is going well. Was it okay for me to do this, right? There's a lot of, um, uh, uh, am I sacrificing myself to my own desires sort of thing here? There's a lot of, um, uh, you know, is this the path? I feel funky, right? The moon very connected to our emotions and our feelings. It's like, oh, I don't know. My, my gut, my intuition is telling me maybe, maybe I did something wrong. I don't know. But here is another way of looking at things. Slightly different order, but kind of makes all the difference, doesn't it? We have Uranus, the fool, first. And saying again, I'm turning away from source and I'm turning towards my own inspiration. And then in the Aquarius star card, we have ourselves um, or a portion of ourselves under our own guiding light, um, pouring out water, AKA experiences, um, where, you know, on one side I have a foot and a knee in the physical world on the grass. We can see the five streams coming out of the jug on the right. That's literally the five senses. But we also have a foot balancing on the water and a jug pouring into the water there too to say that, yeah, I have my physical world experiences, but I'm balancing them with my intuitive experiences. I'm balancing them with my spiritual experiences. I'm listening right now just as much to my internal process as I am to my external world. Very in bulk season, very much where we want to be. And then we see that body of water flow into the moon card. And in the moon card, even though maybe there's some danger here, maybe there's some interesting stuff, 
first off, I think the moon in this looks a lot more benign than it does in the Smith Waite deck, and that's important because it's much less threatening. And what's happening here is ultimately we're being reborn again out of the waters and being presented with the path towards our own inner light, culminating in the Hanged One. We've got the moon on their clothing, right? We have a cross of manifestation right there in the center of their outfit. So this person is like, yep, I'm ready to go. Let's do this. Note their yellow shoes, just like the yellow shoes of the fool. So this is probably the same person, just in a different state, in a different place. Their head now looks like the sun. Right? We have this white sun now their head has white hair, not blonde hair, white hair, with this radiant energy behind it. And where is their head? Just below the ground, like a seed. Right? And what comes after this? Aries. Spring equinox. So we literally are going into the process of planting ourselves in the dark, kind of upside down, right? Head first, like a baby being born. <laughs> and the fool is here saying, yeah, I have to step off the cliff. I have to take this trip. Note also how important purple is in all of these. Purple being an incredibly magical color, a royal color, a color connected to the planet Jupiter, which is about expansion and uh, religion and awareness and mysticism, um, but expansion and opening up to the possibilities is key in Jupiter's energy. I just love this. It, to me, it, it's very spelled out. It's, uh, you know, here's the fool emanating from source, but at the same time turning away from source and saying, no, I'm going to find my own direction. I'm reborn into my life, into whatever this life is going to be. And here I am in the hanged one, just about to manifest my head beneath the ground. I'm getting ready to sprout up and out. <clears throat> and think about that imagery of Aquarius again in the constellation pouring out and Pisces being ready to receive. And here is that water running from the Aquarius, from the star card through the moon card. And if it runs into the hanged man card, it's going to run right into the mouth of the hanged one, just like in the Pisces constellation. And then there's that foot pointing straight up, just like the other part of the Pisces constellation. I'm sure it's just a coincidence, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's not actually. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this time it's not a coincidence. <laughs> All right. Just a little bit more and then a whole lot more. Um, let me bring you back to just me. <laughs> um, there's a little bit more information that is, actually, is, there's a lot more information that's in the workbook. I have been reading um, some of the passages from the workbook that is available to my patrons that are subscribed at the $9 and higher level. Thank you so much to my patrons who make it possible for me to teach these classes for free. You guys fucking kick ass. <laughs> um, so I'm going to leave some of that stuff for uh, folks that are subbed. You guys can read that yourselves. And as always, I will be adding more over the season. So what I want to come back to now um, is kind of a, a recap of what we have talked about tonight, as well as giving you some um, more practical stuff to work with in your rituals and your spell crafting and, and that stuff. Um, so let me go to here and go to there. Okay, so as we discussed previously, um, our ritual forms for in bulk, tending holy wells and other natural resources, 
reaffirming our spirituality. I don't know that we actually really super duper touched on that, but I've said it several times. Um, but yes, this is a thing that's fairly traditional with in bulk season is coming back to your spiritual practice, reaffirming it, rededicating yourself to it in whatever way makes sense for you, whatever that means to you. Um, you know, in fact, I think the more subjective and the more personal that process, the way more potent it's going to be. Um, so rites of passage and initiations and things like that are all very potent at this time of year. We do more holidays that are way more focused on the idea of rites of passage specifically, but initiations and rededication, very potent at this time of year. Um, filling the house with light. So wearing a crown of candles, filling the house with candles and lanterns, um, burning a bonfire, of course, anytime pagans have an opportunity to set something on fire. Duh, obviously we're doing that. Um, burning your Yule greens. That is another ritual that we didn't talk about at the beginning of the class because I wanted to focus on the big ones. But um, burning Yule greens, very, very important and potent during in bulk season. I'm also a fan of stripping your greens, but the idea is to thoroughly transform the energy. So either we're burning it and we are releasing it, and that means you're bringing down all of your evergreen boughs. If you have a wreath on the door, if you've had a, a an evergreen tree in your house for the winter holiday season, now is the time to destroy it with fire, of course. Um, but if it's small enough, I also am a big fan of stripping it and letting it dry and using that for incense or carpet spray or, or like a carpet shake or um, little potpourri bags or anything along those lines. Um, it's very, very nice for that as well. But destroying it in one form or another. Um, spring cleaning. I know we think of spring cleaning as kicking off in spring. I actually think of in bulk season as cleaning in preparation for spring, especially as the light begins to change, you will notice that your house is filthy. <laughs> you will know, like, wow, that's okay. And people, I had let people in my home. Okay. 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 Um, you know, as the light comes back, you can actually see how gnarly stuff is. So <laughs> sometimes it kicks in whether you want to or not. Um, what else are we doing? We're honoring and improving our skills. Um, this is very much in alignment with our Bridget work, um, honoring the tradespeople and the craftspeople and the skilled folk in our community, but also honoring our own. And so having a symbol of any type on your altar in this season that represents the work that you do, wildly potent because you are acknowledging to yourself, yes, I work, let's go. I will have a pen and a journal and a couple of other things on my altar to represent the work that I do. Um, if you're a chef, having a knife or an apron or a mixing bowl on your altar, I mean, literally whatever is a, uh, a you know, something that's close to home that every time you see it, you're like, boom, that's, that's my work. That's my craft. That's the thing I do. That thing. Even if it's just paycheck stubs, that's proof of your work. That's completely valid to me. Um, divination during this system is, is uh, uh, the season is super potent because, of course, we are wanting to find out what is the last bit of our winter work that we need to get done before we transition into the next season. And if we're good there, what do we need to do to prepare for whatever's coming in spring? Making candles, don't sue me, don't set your house on fire. Uh, and I say in every single class, walking in wild places. That's one of the best ways ever that you can um, observe the holiday is to go out into nature and get it on you. <laughs> Let it touch you, get it on you. Okay, food and drink, yada, yada, yada. I don't know, this is all in the, in the thing. Okay, but this, um, for your rituals, and for your spell crafting, for your, know that in both cases, for rituals and spell crafting, if you need images of deities or archetypes, <clears throat> work with the tarot, use the tarot. Um, they're super, super potent and everything's there. <laughs> but we can also work with symbols like Bridget's Cross, Corn Dollies, Fire, Candles, Light, the Milky Way, absolutely, Stars, absolutely, the anvil and plow or symbols of our trade, 
spirals, two, pre two crescents, preapic wands, as we talked about before, besoms, aka brooms, cauldrons, wells, and springs. Um, and... I'm like, what did I... I uploaded something, but I don't know what I did with it. <laughs> I don't know where it is now. <laughs> oh, well. Point being. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, whatever. <laughs> I'll just laugh to myself and move on with my life. Um, but Anvil and Plow absolutely connect to the goddess Bridget. Um, the the Milky Way, I just want to stop with this for a moment. The Milky Way, because uh, other than when there's bad or inclement weather, this is an incredible time of year for stargazing at night because the skies are exceptionally clear. Um it's just before the ease, the season of earth shine, which is a portion of the year when the moon reflects back a lot of earth's light during the new moons. And so they're brighter new moons that's coming up soon, but not quite yet. We also have, um, the zodiacal light or the, it's, it's the illumination of the dust in the zodiacal plane and actually makes kind of like a pyramid shape in the sky. If you're someplace where it's really, really dark, but that also makes it a little more difficult to see the stars. We're not quite there yet. That's going to happen in spring. Um, and we have no major meteor showers of note really until about April. So when the skies are clear, they're exceptionally clear at this time of year. So it is really a fantastic time for stargazing. Also connecting back to that idea that a lot of star goddesses are worshipped at this time of year. That's a big part of that. And corn dollies. This was also something I meant to talk about at the beginning of class and I didn't. And I apologize. But uh, because it's kind of a big deal. <laughs> Back in Lunasod season, Maybon season, one of the pagan practices is to make a corn dolly with the sheaves of the first or the last grains or corn or what have you that are being brought in from the fields. Either it's the first pit, bit of harvest or the last bit of the harvest. There's various traditions. Go watch the classes. But one of the things that gets done with those is that a corn dolly is made. And that corn dolly is kept until now. In some traditions. In some traditions, it's burned in that season. In some traditions, it's burned during uh, Samhain, I think. But in others, it's kept. And so people will bring out their corn dollies now. It's also perfectly fine to make a corn dolly, but you're not going to find any sheaves in the fields right now. So you're going to have to go to a craft store. Um, pick an ethical one, okay? Uh, you're going to have to go to a craft store and get corn sheaves if you if you want to make one right now. Um, or just find some big, like, palm fronds. Those will work, too. <laughs> That's kind of a thing at this time of year. Um, and make a corn dolly. But in theory, you're going to get your corn dolly out that you made last year. And it is going to go into the first furrow that is plowed in the field before the rest of the seeds are planted and the rest of the plowing takes place and all of that stuff, that first cut. And so the idea is that we are taking energy from that old harvest and bringing it into the new crops that are going to be grown this year, carrying through that energy. Okay. Um, this is a Bridget's cross. There is instructions in the workbook on how to make one of these. This one was drawn by the world famous tattoo artist, uh, Jessica Henry. <laughs> um, more of our correspondence. All of these guys, the food, the incense, the plant helpers, all of this stuff, these symbols, again, these can all be used in your rituals and they can all be used in your spell crafting that we are doing throughout this season. And what are we doing? Well, as we said before, rites of passage, initiations, tending holy wells and other natural resources, reaffirming our spirituality, filling the house with light, Wearing a crown of candles, spring cleaning, personal purification, burning Yule greens, uh, honoring and improving our skills, divination, making candles, walking in wild places. Um, and so all of these symbols are appropriate to use in all of those places. The only other thing that that we kind of didn't talk about, eh, I'm not even going to do it, never mind. <laughs> like there's, but I could, eh, but, I, but I don't have to. Um, okay. Last but not least, probably. I, I, it's not. I always say that. And then I'm like, oh, wait, there's 15 more things. Here are some meditations for you to use. 
Um, again, you can use these in ritual for the holiday. You can use these in uh, to start spell crafting or if you're doing any tarot readings for yourself during this time period or what have you. These are cool places to start your magical conversation with yourself, your ancestors, your gods and goddesses. A fresh new world is on its way. What new beginnings are you dreaming up? You are a sacred being and you can do sacred works if you choose to. How are you returning to and honoring your sources of power? Your deep wisdom allows you to see opportunity in the void of the black frozen earth. What sacred seed are you becoming? What could happen this year? And these meditations are inspired by Galen Jalat's book of hours, Prayers to the Goddess. This is a collection of prayers for pagans to the goddess. It's incredible. I love it. Um, it's in the bibliography in the book. Um, last but not least, massive, ridiculous, orgasmic, uh, consensually, uh, uh, of course, um, redonkulous, dump tuck ass of a thank you to my incredible patrons and my incredible students. You guys, <laughs> you're blowing my minds. That's all I'm going to say. All of my minds have been blown. All of them. I had to go get extra ones. You blew those too. Um, it's been really, um, weird and great. <laughs> it's been really fantastic and awful at the same time <laughs> to do this work and to have the confirmation from people that I have had. Um, so thank you. Uh, and I have no intention of stopping anytime soon. So you've created a monster. <laughs> If you are looking for ways to work with me, I do do tarot readings and astrology readings. Um, I teach these classes as well as workshops on tarot and witchcraft. Um, I have my Spinning the Wheel podcast that happens every week. I have my irregular newsletter, a blog on my website, and I do open up tarot mentorships from time to time. Um, maybe I will again this year. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe. <laughs> All right, my friends, let me say, um, I hope that your dreams are inspired. I hope that your sleep is restless. I hope that you allow yourself to drift in these last moments of winter for as long as you need to, because the crone will take her time if you don't give it to her. It's all in your best interest. <laughs> and I want you to focus on dreaming the most ridiculous, amazing, incredible, that could never happen unless maybe what if that thing, that's what I want for you for this season. Decrust, unfreeze, melt, be soggy be damp, be soaked, <laughs> and be a seed with your head underground in the dark, not knowing, but growing. Blessed be heathens. <laughs> Bye for now. Take care of yourselves out there. It's a wild world. <laughs>